All right, we're going to do a little um, crystal field theory like mini recap. Um, really just going over that that crystal field theory part of the chapter. Um, this is probably a good video to watch either before or after lecture. Uh, if you watch before, you'll have a little bit of a preview of what you're going to talk about in class. Um, and if you watch this after class, then you'll have a recap of what you discussed and you can just hear the information again. So that'll be helpful. Um, I am going to go through a presentation. A lot of the same notes that you've probably uh, seen or you've seen something similar. Um, but we're gonna talk about this and maybe hearing it, you know, in a different way or multiple times is what's gonna be the thing that makes it stick. Uh, when we're talking about crystal field theory, this is just another uh, bonding model. So we've talked about a few different bonding models already. Um, we've talked about them a lot more in the earlier portions of the class when we were talking in like chapters oh, 09 and 10 and 11. That's, you know, when we really started talking about electrons and how the electrons sort of interact with each other, how bonds are forming. So crystal field theory is another way that we can look at the like the electron interactions. All right. Uh, it focuses specifically on transition metals. And we've always said that transition metals were kind of like weirdos, right? Like they don't follow the, the normal rules. They have their own sets of properties. Like every time that we were like looking at periodic table trends, we had to always say, well, except for the transition metals. Um, so this is kind of where we get to look a little harder at those transition metals and what makes them different than other things. And the main focus of that is going to be these d orbitals that they have, okay? That a lot of your main group elements, um, they some of your, your bigger main group elements have d orbitals, but they're completely filled. So they're not going to behave the same way as transition metals where you have d orbitals that are acting as valence orbitals, right? Those are gonna be your actual orbitals that are gonna participate in bonding. Uh, so when you're looking at crystal field theory, there's different portions of these um, compounds or these ions that you have to look at, right? Complex ions are gonna form because you have electrons that are lone pairs of electrons on these ligands, okay? Uh, and you should have talked about what ligands are already. You're gonna notice on every, every structure of a ligand that you look at, there are going to be lone pairs of electrons that are gonna be able to attach to central metals, okay? Um, the electrons on the ligands are gonna be attracted to the positive charge on your central metal ion and that metal ion is always going to be a transition metal all right so that's the attractive force that's working the negative you know the electrons the negative charge on the ligands and the positive charge on the metal um, but that's going to be competing with a repulsive force okay because now you have to imagine there's electrons that are on the ligands and they're approaching that central metal well that central metal also has electrons that are part of its structure, okay? And there are going to be electrons that are in unhybridized d orbitals in that metal. And when those two things get really close to each other, the electrons from the ligand and the electrons that are just inherently part of the metal, there's going to be repulsion that occurs because when two negative things get really close together or two positive things get really close together, they repel, okay? Um, we're going to look at a little visualization of that on the next slide. So just a reminder, there are five orbitals in every D sublevel, okay? And these are the names of the D orbitals. And when we're looking at octahedral complexes, which is our main focus in this chapter, there are other structures that exist, and you should know the what they're called, basically, <laughs> but you're not going to be asked specific questions on how to work with those complexes. We're gonna to stick to the octahedral complexes in terms of figuring out um, the electron distribution and the magnetism and the properties and things like that. 
so in octahedral complexes, the the ligands that are coming in and attaching to our central metal, those are going to be occupying the same space as these two orbitals, okay? The lobes of your dx squared minus y squared orbital and your lobes of your dz squared, z squared orbital. All right, and this is what that looks like. So looking at a picture like this can be a little confusing <laughs> um, if you don't know what each of the parts of the picture are, but now that we've kind of laid this out a little bit, take another look at this picture. This is from your textbook. These um, negative charged spheres here, these are supposed to represent the ligands, okay? And then this is your dz squared orbital. Okay, that's that weird, the, the two lobes with that donut around it. Okay, that's the shape of that particular orbital. Um, and notice that these are occupying the same spot, right? So there's electrons here, there's electrons here, and now they're being forced into close proximity, all right? And the same thing is happening in the x squared minus y squared orbital, all right? This is what the shape of that orbital looks like. It's got the four balloons that are attached in the middle, but the positioning of that particular orbital means that each of these lobes of the orbital is really close to where a ligand is also going to be. And ligands are negatively charged, right? Or they have, they, they might not have a charge, but they do have um, lone pairs of electrons that they're bringing to the table, right? So even a neutral ligand like water or ammonia is still going to have electrons that it's bringing in to that central metal and that it's bringing over here to that, that lobe where there's electrons, right? So that's where the repulsion happens. If we look at the other orbitals, um, the other D orbitals in octahedral complexes, and these are gonna be your X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z orbitals, we're gonna see that the orbitals, the orbital lobes themselves, they're not they're not occupying the same exact spot as the ligands, okay? So you have ligands over here and the lobes of these orbitals, they, you know, like you can basically say like, they're not like touching each other, right? Like they're not trying to overlap and occupy the same space. There's space between them. So these three orbitals are gonna show less repulsion or weaker repulsion than the previous two that we looked at. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. In octahedral complexes, your D sublevel, which has five orbitals in it, is going to end up being split into two high energy orbitals and three low energy orbitals. All right, and that's the reasoning behind why that split occurs. Um, so that's going to form kind of the basis of our crystal field theory that split that we're looking at because of the repulsions. Um, now, the difference in the energy levels between the upper level, the higher energy orbitals, and the lower energy orbitals, that's gonna be called your crystal field splitting energy, okay? Pretty straightforward name, just describing the thing exactly. And it's given the symbol delta, just a triangle, it's not like, delta followed by uh, a variable like it usually is. So when you see this delta in reference to chapter 26, you should see that triangle and then think, all right, that's the crystal field splitting energy, okay? And we are going to see that there are two possible types of octahedral comp compounds or complexes that can form when you have that split of orbitals, okay? One type is called a strong field complex. And this is gonna happen when you have a very large energy gap between your lower energy level orbitals and your higher energy level orbitals, right? So we said that this delta value represents our crystal field splitting energy. When this value 
is really large and this gap is really, really big, that's called a strong field complex, okay? And then a weak field complex is just gonna be the opposite. You're gonna have a weak field complex when the energy difference between the low energy and the high energy orbitals, that difference is very small, okay? So if this crystal field splitting energy is a very small number, there's not a lot of it, then we're looking at a weak field complex. All right, so that's the two bits of terminology here. You have strong field complexes with large gaps, and you have weak field complexes with very small gaps, okay? Now, we have to figure out what makes something have a large gap versus a small gap, right? That's gonna be the big thing that we have to like determine in these types of complexes. So we're gonna see that there's two things that can really affect the size of that crystal field splitting energy, okay? One thing is gonna be the type of ligand that attaches to the central metal. And then the other thing is gonna be the charge of the metal ion central metal ion itself, okay? So we're gonna look at both of those things and see how they're gonna affect the size of that split. So first of all, <clears throat> when we're looking at ligands, you're gonna see that they can be arranged in order of their ability to split the D orbitals, okay? What that means is you can take all of the ligands that might possibly attach to your central metal and you can arrange them from the ligand that causes the biggest split to the ligand that causes the smallest split, okay? And that list is called the, spec the spectrochemical series, all right? Largest split on the left side, smallest split on the right side. And this list, you are going to, I'll put it up in a second, you're gonna have to know this list, okay? Um, ligands on the left side, that produce these large delta values, these large crystal field splitting values, these ligands are called strong field ligands because they're going to form strong field complexes. Okay, very straightforward connection there. Um, ligands that have very small delta values, right? They, they're going to be producing these very low energy splits these are gonna be called weak field ligands because they're gonna be forming weak field complexes. All right, and this is the spectrochemical series right from your textbook. You have to have the order of these memorized. You have to be able to look at any ligand that you see and know just by sight, whether it's a strong field or weak field ligand. It's like knowing the strong acids and strong bases in chapter 17, right? If you know it, when you're asked questions about it, it's super easy. But if you don't know it, there's a lot, there's just too much guesswork, okay? Um, I know that Professor Sheehan has like, uh, like a little memory tool to help kind of memorize the order of these. The way I like to look at it is I want you to notice that your strong field ligands, all of them have nitrogen as part of their structure, okay? so. Whenever you see a ligand and there's a nitrogen in that ligand, you should be able to automatically say that's a strong field ligand, okay? Um, the two ligands here, H2O and OH minus, these are your first weak field ligands. So they're right in the middle and notice the similarity in their structure again, right? They're H2O and OH minus. So these are the start of your weak fields, but I like to call them like a midpoint, okay? And then after the hydroxide ion, the four ligands that are left that are listed, these are all halogens, right? These are all in column seven of your periodic table. So it's actually not super hard to know strong field ligands from weak field ligands because there are four strong field ligands. These two, you know, it's, they have them listed as weak field ligands here, but really they're usually weak but every once in a while they can act as a strong field, but you can you can remember them on the weak side and be safe on that. But just remember that they're gonna be on the list before the halogens, right? So it's nitrogen stuff, 
H2O and OH minus halogen stuff. And that's how you're going to kind of remember the series. Um, and all of your strong field ligands are going to have that large delta. All of your weak field ligands are going to have the small delta. All right. Um, so that is the ligand contribution to the, the split in the orbital energy that's going to happen. The other contributing factor to the size of that split is going to be the charge on your central metal. Okay. So we're going to see that that delta value, that energy split is going to increase as the charge on the metal ion increases. Okay. The greater the charge is, the more positive the charge is, the more it's going to want to pull the negatively charged ligand closer to itself. But the closer it pulls the ligand to itself, the more overlap there is between the ligands electrons and the electrons that are in the d orbital of the metal. And so like the closer those two things get, the more repulsion there is, right? So like the, the protons in the metal are like, yeah, come over here, get closer. But the electrons that are on the metal are like, stay away. <laughs> so you have the, those two competing factors. So you can see that when you have, like if you look at cobalt here, right? You have cobalt positive three and cobalt positive two. But cobalt positive three is going to have a greater um, split than cobalt positive two. Same thing with iron, right? Iron three versus ion, iron two, they're right next to each other. But iron three is going to have a greater split <clears throat> than iron two. And you should be able to tell, like, you know, if you have a question that's just like, which of these would have a bigger split? You're not going to have to know that cobalt split is bigger than iron split. But if you're given a set of cobalt ions, you should be able to tell that the cobalt ion with the largest charge is going to have the biggest split. Uh, that's like a fair um, piece of information that we would want you to know uh, and use when you're working with these. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's take a look at how this actually like what this looks like. Um, so here we have two complex ions, all right? Here we have an iron central metal. We have the cyanide ligand attached to it, okay? And here we have an iron central metal and we have the water ligand attached to it. And I left the spectrochemical series up here so that we can kind of remind ourselves, like when we look at this, right? When we look at this complex ion, what we should be able to see right here, we're like, all right, that's a cyanide ion. The cyanide ion is a strong field ligand. There's a large delta value associated with it. So I should see a big gap here between my lower energy level and my upper energy level. All right. And on the other side, we've got water as our ligand. And water is our first weak field ligand. So with our weak field ligand, we're going to see smaller delta values. And we notice here that the, just the distance between the lower energy level and the upper le energy level is much smaller. All right. So this is going to be a strong field complex. And this is going to be a weak field complex. All right. So... This is just another example of this. When you have two, um, you have two complex ions here. And if you're looking at the, the formula for them, they look very similar. And the only difference between the two of them is the charge on the ion itself. And that means that this complex ion was formed with the cobalt two plus ion and this complex ion was formed with the cobalt three plus ion. So this is kind of an example of what I was saying, where you would need to be able to determine like which of these two things would have a larger delta value, the larger splitting energy, and which would have the smaller. And like we were just saying, like our cobalt three plus ion here, this is going to be the one that has the larger crystal field splitting energy. And the cobalt two plus is going to have the smaller crystal field splitting energy. Okay. 
Um, now, the other thing we want to talk about is uh, some, well, are some of the magnetic properties that we're going to say. We've talked about magnetism a few times. So here it is again. Uh, we're going to need to remind ourselves about Hun's rule to really get this, you know, to really understand this correctly. Um, so just reminder, Hun's rule says electrons are going to be occupying degenerate orbitals singly, so one at a time, as long as there's empty orbitals available. So they're only going to pair up after everything's full, okay? And what's still true here is that when we have this crystal field splitting, when when the energy of the d orbitals are going to be split by those ligands, the lower energy orbitals will always fill first, okay? At least initially. <laughs> You're always going to have the, the bottom three orbitals. That's where your first electrons are going to go, okay? Once you fill the first three orbitals with one electron each, so once the d orbitals are half filled, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about all five orbitals, I'm talking about the lower energy three orbitals, the ones that are on the bottom of that split. Once those three orbitals each have one electron in them, two things can happen, okay? You're gonna have scenario one, and scenario one is that fourth electron is going to decide that the distance between the lower level of energy and the upper level of energy, that that distance is too great and it does not wanna to go to the higher energy level and sit in an orbital by itself. So instead, it goes back and it pairs up with the first electron that you put into that lower energy level, okay? This is gonna happen when we have strong field ligands. All right, and I'll show you hopefully a little more clearly like what I'm talking about with that, but let me just explain this one as well. The second scenario is gonna happen when we have weak field ligands. And in this case, the electron, the fourth electron, the one that has to make a decision, it's gonna decide that the energy gap isn't that bad and it will go up and it will sit in that empty upper orbital, okay? Um, let me actually sketch this out. Um, stop share. So we're going to have strong field versus weak field. Okay, and we're going to put ourselves um, in the mind of an electron, right? Octahedral complexes are going to look the same in terms of their format. So we're always gonna have our three low energy orbitals on the bottom, and then our two higher energy orbitals on the top. All right, and this is a strong field. So notice that when I drew this gap, it was a large, a very large energy split. And for my weak fields, I'm still gonna have my three lower energy orbitals but my upper, my higher energy orbitals, they'll just, they'll be a little bit closer. There'll be a much smaller split here, smaller energy, okay? So now you're an electron, okay? We're all electrons and we have to, there's, let's say that there are um, six of us. Okay, we've got six electrons that we're looking to distribute here. All right, so electron number one, let's, we'll do the strong field complex first, okay? So electron number one is like, great, I got my own spot, here I am. Electron number two says, I got my own spot as well. And so does electron number three. The first three are always easy. They're always gonna fill those three spots. Now you have electron number four. And electron number four is looking at it as two options. It's looking at option number one, which is it has to go over here 
and it has to occupy the same spot as another electron, which it doesn't really want to do because electrons don't really want to be near each other. But its other option is to climb this entire energy gap and go sit up here. Okay. So my good visualization for this is like, this is like climbing 10 flights of stairs. And this distance is like step, stepping up a curb. Okay. So it's a very significant energy like input that would have to go into this. So this fourth electron in this case is like, it looks up here and it's like, I'm absolutely not climbing up 10 flights of stairs. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to sit next to my reluctant friend. And the other electrons that we still have to place are going to follow that same pattern. So five and six are also going to come down here and pair up. Now at this point, let's say we had another electron. If I had seven electrons at this point, if all these lower energy orbitals are full, now that seventh electron will be forced up the stairs and it would have to go up here. All right, but it's only gonna go up there if it has to. All right, so now let's go back to, we got our six electrons and now we have our weak field complex. So electrons one, two, and three are gonna do their thing. And now electron four looks at its options. Am I gonna go back here and sit in this tiny space with some other electron? Or am I gonna step up the curb and go have my own spot? And so electron number four says, I want my own space. Electron number five says, same. And now electron number six is going to be forced back into sharing with electron number one. Okay. So that is the difference between strong field complexes and weak field complexes. All right. And strong field complexes, you get a lot more pairing up of electrons. And in weak field complexes, you get a lot more separation. Okay. All right. Go back to our little presentation. Called it a mini lecture in my notes. We just have a little recap. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at here. Okay. Uh, and I think it's probably easier to see now that we've talked through how the electrons got there. So you can see that with that large split, all the electrons end up pairing up. And with a smaller split, all the electrons end up spreading out, okay? And how does this affect magnetism? Because we know these definitions are not new, paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. A paramagnetic complex is gonna be one where there are any unpaired electrons, right? And a diamagnetic complex means that everything has a pair and there is no magnetism. And what we're gonna see is that a lot of times low spin complexes, which we call complexes that have more electrons paired up. Low spin complexes are going to happen more often when we have strong field ligands. And, you know, and if you think about like why that would be, well, when you have two electrons that are in an orbital together, they're always going to spin in opposite directions. And when two electrons spin in opposite directions, um, their spins cancel out. And that electron spin, that's what causes magnetism. So when we're pairing up electrons, we're canceling out their magnetism, right? We're canceling out their spin. So when we have strong field ligands, we end up with lots of paired electrons. And these are called low spin complexes. All right, so a lot of times your strong field ligands are gonna produce low spin complexes because they're gonna end up wanting to pair up because no one wants to go up the 10 flights of stairs. In our weak field scenario with our weak field ligands, a lot of these ligands end up producing what are called high spin complexes. And they're called high spin because we end up with more single electrons, single electrons, their spin is going to count towards the overall magnetism. So we ended up with a lot of spin here. Okay. 
So high spin complexes are going to be more often found with our weak field ligands because we're going to have a lot of ligands. I mean, we're going to have a lot of electrons that are able to separate out and be by themselves. Um, and then low spin complexes are going to be the strong field ligands because they are going to tend to pair up because they don't want to go up that giant energy uh, jump. Um, so when, again, we're just looking at, this is just like a recap of what we saw with the, the two iron compounds that we looked at, or two iron ions. We saw that the cyanide ion is strong field. And when it split, it formed a low spin complex, right? Strong field complexes also tend to be low spin complexes, all right? Uh, and in this case, we have the complex um, ends up being diamagnetic because all of those electrons are paired up. Over here with H2O, we see that it's a weak field ligand and it's formed a weak field complex. That weak field complex is also called a high spin complex, right? Because we have a lot of single electrons um, spread out. And because we have a lot of unpaired electrons, aside from being high spin, it's also paramagnetic, all right? Um, now, not every ion has like a, a high spin version and a low spin version. In this case, iron did. Iron has a low spin version, which we're seeing here, and it has a high spin version that we're seeing here. But not every ion has two options, okay? The only ions that can have both low spin complexes and high spin complexes are electron are ions that have electron configurations with 4D electrons, 5D electrons, 6D electrons, or 7D electrons, okay? When you do the electron configuration out and you see how many D electrons you're working with, if you have only one, two, or three D electrons, the only complex you're gonna be able to make is a high spin complex because you're only gonna be able to put those electrons in these bottom three orbitals. If you have electron numbers that are eight, nine, or 10, that means that no matter what you do, you're gonna be filling up this bottom row and using your top row as well. Right. Um, you can when you do some examples, you'll be able to try this out. Also, you don't have to just trust me on it. But you're going to see that the only time that you have the option for both low spin and high spin complexes is when you're working with four to seven electrons. And in those cases, that the the diagram that you end up with is going to be directly related to the ligand that you're working with. Okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna do an example here. I've written out the steps here so that you can see them one at a time. Uh, this question says, how many unpaired electrons are there in the complex ion COF6 three minus? Is the ion diamagnetic or paramagnetic? Um, and for starters here, and I, I wrote step one here, so I'll, we'll look at that first. Step one is going to be to determine the charge of the metal and then the number of D electrons that the metal has. Okay. I just want to show you the charge part of it real quick. Um, and then we'll move on with the rest of this explanation. Uh, stop sharing real quick. Oh, it's my eraser. Here it is. So we have CO F6 three minus. Before you can do anything with determining like electron distribution in an octahedral complex, you have to look at the complex ion that you're working with and you have to figure out this charge. Okay, that's also gonna be true when you're naming them. So this, the ability to do this is gonna be linked to all parts of this chapter. So what we're seeing here is that 
you've got the cobalt ion, you've got six fluoride ions, which are F minus one, and the overall charge is minus three. Okay. And just like when we were doing, I feel like it was some like oxidation reduction stuff. When you have a complex ion, the charges here have to add up to the overall charge on your complex ion. So you have cobalt and you have six fluorides. And when you add that together, it has to equal negative three. And that's how you're always gonna be able to figure out the charge on your central transition metal, right? Uh, you know, fluoride's got a negative one charge. So it's gonna be cobalt plus negative six equals negative three plus six plus six. So that's how we know that our cobalt is gonna have a plus three charge, all right? Now, the second thing that's in the slides that I wrote is the electron configuration. That's another thing that if you don't remember how to do the electron configurations of transition metal cations, you have to go back and remind yourself because that's gonna be critical. To do any electron configuration of a transition metal cation, start out by writing the neutral configuration of the I of the of the element that you're going to be turning into an ion. Okay. So take your cobalt. Um, cobalt is in your fourth row. It's element number 27. So if we were going to do the electron configuration for this, we can use our shorthand. So we have argon, then we have 4s2, and then we're going to have 3D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 3D7, okay? And what this tells us, positive three charge, it means that we're taking three electrons away from that, okay? But where you take the electrons from is critical, okay? When you're removing electrons, you always remove electrons from the highest N value so the highest principal energy level first. So you're always gonna end up removing your S electrons before you remove your D electrons. Okay, so in this case, we need to remove three electrons. We're gonna remove both of those electrons and then we still need to remove another one. So we'll remove <clears throat> that last electron from the D sublevel. Okay, um, so that is how we end up with what we're seeing in the slide here. Uh, and we end up with the final electron configuration for this ion of 4s0, 3d6, okay? And now what we're gonna pull out of this electron configuration is the fact that there are six d electrons, okay? And these six d electrons are gonna be the ones that we distribute in our diagram, okay? So now our next step, is gonna to be to figure out whether the ligand that's attached to our cobalt is strong field or weak field, and we're gonna base that on the electrochemical series. So if we have COF6, F is over here, it's a weak field ligand. So now we know that the energy split is gonna be very small, all right? So now we can draw out the diagram and we can, we know that it's a weak field ligand, so it's gonna be a small split. So when we're distributing our six electrons, we're gonna put in our first three. So one, two, three, and that fourth electron is gonna make the step up because it's, again, this is like a small step up a little curve. So electrons four and five are gonna occupy the top two orbitals and then electron six will come back down here and pair up with that first one. Okay, so we end up with a high spin complex in this case.
the last thing we want to do is count the unpaired electrons and determine the magnetism. So here we see that there are four unpaired electrons. And because we have unpaired electrons, this would be a paramagnetic complex. OK? Uh, so we'll do another example here. How many unpaired electrons are there in this complex ion? And again, the same question as diamagnetic or paramagnetic. And we're going to start the same way, where we determine the charge of the metal and the number of d electrons it has. So the metal in this case is going to be CO positive 3 again. Let's take a look at this. We won't find the, uh, the electron configuration again because it's the same. But it's just worth finding the, the charge again just to make sure that that's that that feels OK. So we have CO, NH3, 5, NO2, and then the overall charge is 2 plus. So now the thing, the way that we want to kind of set this up is we're going to say that if we add the cobalt charge to 5 NH3s, and we add the NO2 minus, all of this added together has to equal positive two, okay? Um, we don't know this charge. We do know, we do know that um, ammonia is neutral, so it doesn't have a charge. So we can substitute in a zero right here. And we know that the nitrite ion has a negative one charge. So cobalt plus five times zero plus negative one has to equal positive two. So we can cross that out there. Cobalt minus one equals positive two. And that is how we get back to positive three again. Okay. And then finding the electron configuration will look the same there. All right. So now once we have that information, step two, again, same, same step two. We determine whether the ligand is strong field or weak field based on the spectrochemical series. And both ligands that are attached in this case are both strong field ligands. Um, you should not have any examples in, at this level where you have like a strong end weak field ligand together. But if you have a strong field ligand, that strong field ligand is going to make the split large anyway. Um, so you can keep that in mind. But you should only be looking at ones where it's like just strong or just weak because we're not going like into um, any greater detail with this. Uh, so here we see that we're looking at strong field ligands. So we're going to be expecting a very large energy split. And once we make that split large and we go to distribute our six electrons, we know that our first three electrons are going to be by themselves. And then electron, num <clears throat> electron number four is going to look up here and it's going to see those 10 flights of stairs and it's going to say absolutely not i'm going to go right over here and sit with my buddy and electrons five and six are going to follow that same pattern and what we end up with is a low spin complex here and if we're counting unpaired electrons that's easy in this case it's zero and when we have zero unpaired electrons we are looking at a diamagnetic complex, OK? Uh, and that is it for crystal field theory. So practice with that information. Um, try some problems out. Watch the chapter 26 um, example video that is also on YouTube, because you'll be able to actually try the problems out on your own and then kind of watch me explain them. And I think that'll be the best way to get some practice with this. All right, have a good day, study hard.